and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show where one and seven eighths inches per second might still be a little too fast for us. And speaking of slow things, uh, yeah, this is going to be my first round of uh, random audio cassettes in about four years now. Partially because the last round did not go over too well. I can only imagine why it didn't go over too well. Anyway, uh, unlike the previous installments of Random Audio Cassettes, uh, we do not have any voyeur tapes, as I call them here today. Uh, the tapes that are non-musical, home-recorded, not meant for public consumption. Everything here today is music, and it was meant, to some degree at least, for public consumption. So anyway, we have uh, four tapes to really look at here, three albums and one EP, and they all fall into one of two camps, cheesy or sleazy. And uh, actually, let's start with one of the sleazy tapes here. And uh, yes, we will alternate between the two so you don't overload on any one type. But anyway, uh, if you're into heavy metal and or punk, this is your episode. And as such, I do not want to hear any complaints about my musical choices being soft today. But the price you pay for your heavy metal and your punk is... I'm going to put you through two of the absolute cheesiest things I've ever covered on this show. And that's a pretty high bar. So anyway, finally getting down to business here. Today's first tape is the aforementioned EP. Uh, I brought this with me from Colorado, but I just never covered it at the time. And this is our heavy metal tape of the day. So this is the 1995 demo tape from a band called Hallucinasia. Also, what's on the box today. And uh, I can only guess that band name has something to do with Asian people dropping acid or something. Anyway, uh, yes, Hallucinasia, as you might expect, was from Denver. And uh, alas, they're pretty representative of Denverite metal. Uh, kind of, like, half-threatening. And uh, to put this in perspective, no major metal groups have ever come out of Denver, or Colorado for that matter, that I'm aware of at least. I think we had one scrape the bottom of the charts once for one week on a really slow week. But anyway, uh, there's actually a common thread to all four of today's main tapes, and that would be the vocals. Uh, they're all some degree of wonky. So on this one, uh, for one, the lyrics are kind of wonky, but the vocals, it sounds like an American Ozzy Osbourne who is prone to biting his tongue a lot. That's the only way I can really describe this. So, uh, I guess I should name the singer. Our uh, big offender this time is a guy by the name of Vince Stott. And Stott actually went on to form another somewhat bigger band a few years later called Typhoid Mary. And they were a fairly big deal in and around Denver for quite a long time, uh, all through my music years and for quite some time thereafter. But uh, I wound up going back and listening to their first album, streaming it. I'd never heard it before. And uh, to hear if Vince Stott had ever really advanced. And he did. Uh, the lyrics and vocals did improve by 2000 was when that thing came out. But nonetheless, Stott was only involved in that first Typhoid Mary album, because in 2001, he was driving home from a gig one night, fell asleep at the wheel, and you can guess what happened. It's not going to stop me from making fun of Hallucinasia, though.
Our next tape, and our first cheesy tape, comes to us from 1986. And, oh boy, is it from 1986. It is overwhelmingly from 1986. I mean, in theory, this tape should have turned to dust on January 1st, 1987. But instead, by some miracle, at this point, it just has a mild case of sticky shed syndrome. So anyway, this album is 100% pure, unadulterated, mid-80s mom rock. And the woman who made this, uh, rather appropriately, her voice is this kind of odd, uneasy cross between Terry Nunn of the band Berlin and Carly Simon. So anyway, the woman in question is Sophie Carpenter. And unfortunately, I don't have much info on this album. Uh, there's no significant information on here. You got the track titles and the year and the artist name, and that's about it. So I don't know who played on this. I don't know where it was recorded and so on and so forth. But uh, I would be willing to bet quite heavily that Sophie dumped some pretty good money into the making of this thing. I mean, really, this is about as slick a pop record as you could independently make in the mid-80s. Now, as for Sophie herself, she doesn't have a website, and she doesn't seem to do social media, so I've had to kind of piece this together. But I guess she is originally from St. Louis. She moved to Santa Cruz, California at some point, where apparently this thing was recorded. Uh, it certainly has a very Southern California vibe to it. And uh, speaking of Santa Cruz, we actually have one more Santa Cruz tape for you today. But anyway, uh, yeah, her big stab at adult contemporary stardom did not pan out. Uh, she ultimately went back to St. Louis and ultimately settled into just occasionally making some more kind of folky singer-songwriter albums. And that seems to be what she's still doing today. So as for this album... It's been kind of, sort of, reissued. So in 2007, Sophie went back and recut the vocals, and in one case completely rewrote the lyrics to a song and changed the title and everything. Uh, at least one song seems to have been partially re-recorded, instrumentally speaking, and at least one song it has been slowed down, so it's in at least equivalent to a lower key, and as one would expect, it's been pretty extensively remixed. And unfortunately, a lot of the uh, 1986-ness of it got stripped out in the process. But if you're curious, the current title is You Came Here For A Reason, and you can stream it on YouTube, or you can download or stream it on Amazon.com. But uh, really, I'd rather see the original get reissued. I mean, this thing is just intoxicatingly dated. Seriously, this thing will turn your socks pastel pink. I want you to be mine Someone to say no for A reason to stay home Someone to say no for And someone to get a go for Someone 
I think a pretty good percentage of the Archive's audience has at least some affection for uh, horror movies and just cult cinema in general, myself included. And I know I personally have a real soft spot for albums that people made on their little four-track cassette decks, and I love it when I find somebody's homemade album with the homemade artwork and at times handwritten lyrics and that sort of thing. So, uh, as such, I really, 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 really wanted to like today's second and final, if you will, sleazy tape. And boy, is it sleazy. But instead, it just left me pretty cold. So anyway, this is our other Santa Cruz tape. And this is from a horror punk group called The Gore Hounds. And uh, I had to make sure I kept my story straight here because... As it turns out, there were three bands called the Gore Hounds within a decade, so I had to make sure I consistently had the Santa Cruz Gore Hounds. But anyway, this is their apparent first album, and admittedly I had to censor the artwork a little bit here. But uh, this is called 1995 Conspiratorial Efforts, and uh, I'll let you guess when this thing was made. Now, uh, they, as one would expect being a horror punk group, they do have a sense of humor, a pretty black one. But unfortunately, the jokes for me just never really land. And at the same time, they're trying way too hard to be edgy and shocking. And more often than not, they just wind up being corny. And also, this being punk, usually we associate punk with some level of efficiency. It takes them an hour to limp their way through 13 tracks. So uh, why am I covering this at all, you might ask? Well, it's because it does have its amusing moments. I'm not entirely sure they're on purpose, but uh, we'll listen anyway. Now, for you history geeks, I'll try and finish up the history of the group here. Um, They did apparently develop a little bit of a cult following in and around Santa Cruz, and they got some songs onto some local compilation CDs, but it looks like that second album never did come to pass. And it looks like, according to an unsighted source anyway, they broke up in 1999. And I have had zero luck tracking down any of the members of this group. Which is pretty uniquely punk when you think about it.
Today's final album is the single cheesiest album I have covered on this show to date. And that's saying something. So uh, this is another tape that I brought with me from Colorado, but I never covered it at the time. And I wound up disqualifying it from the local flavor episodes, the last two that I did before I left, because I just couldn't confirm that it was local or even regional for that matter. But anyway, I'm covering it here. I think this is the right time for it. This is from one Paul Woodson, and the album is called, uh, kind of obscured by the price tag, but uh, the title is In the Spotlight. And unfortunately, that's all the info I've really got for you here. I think this is from 1993. But, uh, yeah, I can't confirm where it was recorded, and I can't even find anything on this guy. Uh, I found a singer by the name of Paul Woodson, who was from many years earlier, but also from Jersey. And I mean the island, not New Jersey. And our Paul Woodson just sounds too uniquely American to my ear. So I'm going to say the odds are very, very slim that it's the same guy. And not only that, the guy here sounds like he was reasonably young at the time, maybe in his 30s. So anyway, um, this album, it's just glorious. It's a God-level slab of lounge lizard cheese. Uh, Paul has a very thin and kind of a high voice, but at the same time, his pitch is really good. He nails just about every note, but at the same time, it's that high, thin voice. It's not a very commanding voice, so you have that odd mix of technically solid, but still kind of unappealing. Now, as for his music, there is no band on here. Every single cut is a pre-cooked MIDI musical instrument digital interface karaoke file. And also, every single cut ends with a totally bombastic crescendo, whether it's appropriate or not. And uh, this is, I think there's one song that might be an original on here, but I can't confirm that. But about half of the confirmed covers are based on usually much later and much less popular renditions of pretty standard, pretty well-known tunes. So, if the gore hounds left you with musical diarrhea, Paul Woodson will plug you right back up. Sun. I'll be sitting when the evening comes Just sitting on the dock of the bay Watching the tide roll away Oh, the light Nothing's gonna change Everything still remains the same Well, I might take a plane a train. If I gotta walk, I'm gonna fly just the same. Kansas City, Kansas City, I come. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. They got some crazy little women there. You don't know where to go to Why don't you go where fashion sits 
foot down the ribs. Spangled gowns upon a bevy of high browns from down the land, the old misfits. Putting on the ribs. Top hat, white tie, and tape. Stop myself from getting confused The head red Situation's big and got a part-time job in my heart Situation's big and got a part-time job in my heart Situation's big and got a part-time job in my To close things out here, I want to excerpt one cut from an album that I found on a thrifting episode, I think maybe about a year ago, and I wound up not doing this one as a whole work for this episode because it's just not consistently cheesy and or sleazy enough, but uh, I guess this one falls more into the cheesy camp. So anyway, this comes to us by way of another mystery artist, one that I just can't find any info on. Uh, her name, I guess, is just Nicole. Uh, I guess she doesn't have a last name. And this is her album, Strictly Country, which in my mind would imply that there were others, like uh, Strictly Jazz, Strictly Show Tunes, Strictly Pop, whatever it might be. But uh, yeah, I can't find any evidence of there being any further Nicole recordings out there. And just finding a singer simply named Nicole turned up about a hundred different people. So yeah, that didn't work too well. But anyway, Nicole is first and foremost a lounge pianist and a perfectly competent lounge pianist. And one that's apparently been at it for so long that she falls into that camp where she can kind of just barf out any old tune, you know, hum a few bars and I can fake it. You know, she's hit that level. So, uh, otherwise she does pick up the guitar on here, I believe three times over the course of the album. And that's the only time that she really truly fails. She just cannot play guitar. She, uh, it's kind of out of tune and she's just very ham fistedly banging away and, uh, on songs that could use a little more finesse to boot. And her singing voice is limited, but adequate. And, uh, about two thirds of this album is instrumental anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So I guess I've kind of set you up to believe that I'm going to leave you with one of the guitar cuts on here, guitar vocal cuts. But uh, no, actually, I want to leave you with one of the instrumental piano tracks, because this is one of those tunes that just does not work as an instrumental piece. So with that, your assignment, dear viewer, is to caterwaul away with Nicole's seemingly Vince Guaraldi induced rendition of achy breaky heart and otherwise that is going to be it for today's archive join me next time when I find a severed puppy's head on my doorstep because you know I made fun of the sleazy groups <laughs>